Shalom, Shalom, and Salam to all of you. Shalama to everybody. We hope that you are doing well, and we are so glad to be with you today on the first Mona K show that we have taken a few weeks off, and we are back. And uh, we want to thank you. Yes, we were uh, not feeling well for a few weeks, but we are back, and we are so thankful that you are tuning in today and you are with us. Uh, we have a very special co-host that I'm gonna be introducing uh, in a few minutes, but as you can tell from the beginning of the program, we're not starting our program the normal way. So we are going to go ahead and um, explain to everybody what we're doing here and what the program is about today. Thank you once again for tuning in. For those of you that are on Facebook right now, if you would do me a favor, share, 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 so we can have as many people uh, online with us as possible. And the other thing is if you could, if you have any questions, if you are a non-Assyrian uh, or Assyrians, anyone uh, understanding, and we're doing an English program because of the fact that there are so many people speaking English. Of course, we are Assyrian Americans living in the greatest country in the world. And there are many that don't speak Assyrian. And we wanted to be able to showcase today's program and to explain what it is that we are doing today. As we've expressed many times throughout um, this program, the many of you that have followed us back when through our radio program onto the media digital program that we're having right now, uh, we have always explained the theme of this broadcast has always been to raise awareness to the plight of the persecuted and abandoned Assyrians that um, continue to suffer. And many people don't know that because they keep, they are in suffering in, uh, in persecution and in, um, for the most part, in silence and obscurity. Today's program is one that fulfills one of the purposes and missions that we have vowed to keep um, as Assyrian Americans. As the United States is preparing for the midterm election, and we want to acknowledge that there is a midterm coming, and it's very important that we all get involved, get engaged into the civil um, engagement. However, today's program is a bit more somber. As you have noticed, and I mentioned from the way that we started the broadcast, today we paused. Uh, uh, today we pause from our regular engagement to give a well-deserved honorary moment of silence, a moment to pay tribute, a time to appreciate and give thanks for the sacrifice of one man that we are honoring today on the show and we are about to speak about all of his sacrifices. Today we celebrate the life and the falling asleep of a humble man that sacrificed for his nation and his Christian faith in calm stillness. Today, we honor a man that the world may not have known as well as we do, yet his steadfast stance to continue to fight precedes him. Today, my honored co-host and I will try to detail the life of the spiritual leader known as the Patriarch of the Ancient Church of the East, Mar Adday II Giwargis, who was chosen to take on a leadership role during a time, for the most part during that time in Iraq, was confusion, conflict, and division. I would like to introduce shortly, right now, uh, my, my special co-host, who's a spiritual father to me. Uh, co-host, of course, he's, he's, a, he's in his own home, of course. He's not a guest at all, but he's a father figure for all of us. Core Bishop Athanasis Toma. He's the parish priest of Marshalita Church in Los Angeles. We would uh, like, before we begin to speak about our subject and discuss our subject matter, I would like for um, the viewers to welcome Kura Episcopa Athanasis Toma uh, as he starts the program with a prayer. Welcome to the program, Ravi. We're so honored to have you on the program today with us. Thank you for having me, Mona, and thank you everyone who is watching out there. Uh, as you said, we'll open our program with a prayer uh, on the soul of our beloved patriarch, uh, as uh, basically as, as the church goes through really sad times, as you, as you mentioned. So we'll open it with a prayer, then we'll proceed, and then uh, we'll share our thoughts and comments with our viewers there. So if you don't, with everyone else, let's bow our hair in prayer, basically. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, those who slept, awakened by your tenderness, 
to the living, guard them with your abundant of your mercy, and preciously awaken your servant, His Holiness Mar Adi II, who slept in the hope of resurrection, Lord of all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rabbi. We're going to give you a proper introduction later on. I just want to go on to let people know what we are, what our program is about today for those that are tuning in. For those that are in, in the Assyrian community, you know that we lost our uh, patriarch, the father of our church, one of the churches, of course, one of the, uh, we can say the second largest churches here in, a, uh, in the Assyrian community, uh, ancient church of the East. His name is uh, Mar Edde, His Holiness Mar Edde II. He's the patriarch of the ancient church of the East. We'd like to give you a, brief, a little bit about why we are doing this program. His Holiness the Patriarch's life and passing uh, is yet another shared uh, account of the continuing struggle uh, of our nation because our nation continues to st struggle, like we said. This is one of those continuing struggle of persecution and the sacrifice of the Assyrian Christians that has yet to be told. So here we are, we are speaking and we are giving you another chapter of a, um, of a sacrifice given, but again, in silence and, and for the most part, no one sees it and no one knows it. Today's program is another episode in the ongoing chronology of saga of those that have yet to find their voice as they fight to gain their rights to live with dignity. This is the continuing fight of a nation that has been, for the most part, abandoned and forgotten by the world uh, to fend for themselves. We are a stateless nation. We are a uh, nation without any arms, no political power, and no financial uh, power as well. So we fend for ourselves for the most part. His Holiness was ordained and thrust to lead the ancient church of the East during a difficult time in Baghdad, Iraq. Still, here's the miracle. Still, for the next 50 years, he demonstrated his lifelong sacrifice to remain fully committed and relentlessly shepherd his flock despite living in a war zone. The deteriorating Assyrian nation that was still recovering from the many atrocities suffered during the continuous persecution of genocides, massacres, and many battles being marginalized, their lands being taken, uh, their faith being attacked. It was called upon he, he, this man that we are speaking about today, he was called upon as a young man to sacrifice his life for the church nation that nurtured him and nurtured the nation. This is why we are surviving today. It's because of the nurture of the church. He was regarded as a spiritual loving father, yet not to be mistaken for weakness. He was a fearless protector fighting to protect his flock. His resilience, his strong spirit, and the will to battle is truly epic. And that is why we want the world to know who this man is. He lived in obscurity, sacrificing his life, but he will not die in obscurity because he needs to be honored as we are today. However, he continued head on confronting because he continued to make every confrontation of the enemy head on with the forces of evil, that kind of life came at a price. Having endured much hardship and difficulty while carrying the burden of the church community, he suffered in the shadows, again, in obscurity, in the shadows, in silence, as his physical health declined. After battling, battling health issues, many uh, health issues for the past few years, His Holiness Mar Adde II Giwargis fell asleep in the Lord on February 11th, 2022 in Glendale, Arizona at the age of 74. It is truly indeed proper to describe his earthly service as written in 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love this appearing. Let me now properly introduce my honored co-host, 
um, again, spiritual father, Kur Episcopa Athanasis Toma. I'm not going to give away your age, Ravi, because you're still a young man. But I do want to say that he's the son of a deacon, um, and you are currently serving as Kur Episcopa, as we say, or Kur Bishop, to the con community of Marshalita Parish of the Ancient Church of the East in Los Angeles, California, and the so um, Southern California region. You come from a family that deeply devoted to the Church of the East. The family was known as the scribes or writers for uh, some of today's church books like uh, the Pardesa, the Paradise of Eden, an explanation of dreams. Um, you know, Ravi, this, this uh, biography of yours needs to be uh, focused on. And I told you after we, uh, as we were speaking earlier, after we uh, are, you know, put His Holiness, uh, we honor him properly and we put him in his, um, uh, and we bid him farewell. Uh, I will look to you to have another program, God willing. We will talk about the importance of all of that you're doing and everything that you're doing. Because the other day I heard you're doing Bible studies on Zoom, which is unbelievable. And people were could not stop, I mean, just boasting about your knowledge and uh, your um, your faith and, and the explanation. So uh, once again, Rabbi, um, thank you so much for being on the program. It is such an honor. Welcome. It's my pleasure to be with you. Uh, and I, I appreciated the way you started the program, but His Holiness, I think uh, there is enough words to describe his dedication to his nation, the work, the kind of work that he put for the church, honestly. Uh, it's it's a, it's a great loss for the church uh, in general and to the Assyrian community, especially especially in Iraq, uh, modern today's days, basically. So uh, we will go through his uh, chronologically with his uh, life, the way he started from his young age and to the day, to the last days of his life, basically, as he spent it out of his country, out of his beloved country where he was born and taught and the tradition, the church and everything else. So we hope that we will be able to uh, give enough information or satisfy our viewers with what we're going to be talking about today. And like I said, there isn't enough time, honestly, the more we say, as much as we say, there isn't enough that we can say about this, uh, His Holiness, uh, for all the work and dedication that he has done for his community. And yeah. His for for a man that could have chosen to live anywhere, for a man that had the world yes. uh, pretty much, I would want to say at his feet, but I mean at his backing. And as a leader of the ancient church of the East, he could have uh, governed from anywhere, but he chose to stay. And that yes. choice is what makes it so heroic. And that choice to face uh, what was going on um, is so heroic. And we're going to discuss about the fact that in 2006, his church, the St. Mary's Cathedral, was bombed while he was conducting Mass. Yes. And not many yes. people know how, how much he was targeted. But at the same time, he was very diplomatic. He knew how to shepherd his flock, but he also knew how to communicate with the outside world so that there was no harm to bring to the already dwindling, persecuted, tired and uh, uh, you know, pretty much a broken community. Where were you sure. when you heard, and how did you hear about the passing of His Holiness Rabbi? I, I received a phone call. Basically, uh, was it about ten thirty or eleven o'clock in the morning? I was working from home that day, and then received that phone call. As I was expecting something, honestly, because we've seen his health being deteriorating, and and we were just uh, hoping he was going to pull through, but. Again, uh, the word of the Lord is basically his work is different than <laughs> he, he has his own programs, his own way of uh, uh, basically uh, work and his, uh, his his job is different than we more than what we think. We cannot we cannot expect what he does and he knows better for us what's better for us as as mankind. So he called on yeah. himself, but it was, it was that day. It was definitely a sad day for the church and we're still yeah. mourning that so yeah yeah i um i know that uh through your service to the church rabbi you became very close to him and you were able to watch him and see him up close what was one of the things that impressed you the most about him 
Uh, His Holiness, uh, one of the things, Mona, that uh, he has visited Marshall Lita Parish, uh, the community itself, and every time he came here, we were lucky enough to have him for uh, five days, four days, and he stayed with us, basically. He enjoyed staying here. The thing about, uh, for those who don't, uh, hadn't been close to him, basically, I was so close to him in many ways. He made me feel like a, he was a father figure, definitely. I mean, you, mm-hmm. I knew his holiness. I mean, he, he hold this rank, which is such a high rank in the church. But I never felt that I was around someone who was really, uh, who takes pride of what he does and what who he is. He was such a humble person, made you so comfortable to be around him. Uh, he was a people's person honestly uh so i enjoyed i enjoyed being with him and he was very simple very simple and straightforward person uh honestly uh he had no politics none of these so it was it was a joyful moment to be around him and it was it was a blessing it was a blessing to be around him yeah Yeah. during the time that he uh came to glendale and of course we are in glendale and attend St. George Church of the Ancient Church of the East. I had the opportunity, as you mentioned, Rabi, and by the way, for those of you that are watching, you'll see a um, the, the, uh, the pictures that we are uh, featuring. These are pictures that uh, I've been compiling for the past few days. And thank you, Fred. Of course, this program wouldn't be possible without Fred Duman and Cinnamon Production. Uh, production. We always have to uh, thank him because he does a phenomenal job. Um, we compiled them, and I want to thank my brother Aziz, Aziz, um, who is the nephew of His Holiness, um, His late uh, His Holiness Mar Adde, who helped compile. He he called Iraq, he called w- everywhere, and I want to thank you, um, you know, for for helping me compile these pictures. And as you can see, a lot of them are very rare pictures that have never been seen from the day of his ordination. I'm not sure if you can see them, Ravi, but these pictures, the black yes. and white, uh, yes, the sir. pictures of the groups. Yeah, those are beautiful pictures. And then as we go along, this is 50 years of, um, of, of service. Now, what I was uh, going to say is that he was here for the visit of many of his visits uh, that, he, that he did throughout uh, his life. And of course, um, he got, he became ill and required surgery. and. Um, unfortunately, uh, I got close to him during this time when he was very ill, but nevertheless, I really consider it a blessing. I was with him through many of the procedures, many of the visits, and I got to be very close to him. And the words that you described him, Rabi, truly, truly are so fitting. He was approachable. He was, yes. he was a simple man. He didn't uh, boast about his position. He spoke simple words. He was very funny, very funny. Um, We joked around a lot and uh, you just, you became a kin, you you bonded quickly and he was a father figure. And uh, I was so blessed to have um, spent maybe about a year um, close uh, to him. And uh, I'm honored to have known him um, and, and, and be close that way to him. So, uh, I, I'd like for us right now to transition into his accomplishments and read about his biography. So what I'd like to do is, and then you can pick it up, um, Ravi afterwards. Sure. I want to read a little bit about the uh, official letter that was sent by the Holy Synod of the ancient church of the East, of course, by the secretary of the Holy Synod, which is his grace, Margi Vargis Yonan. And he starts, and I hadn't seen this before, I actually put, and it says, I have fought the good fight. I have uh, finished mm-hmm. the race. But I just want to say, um, he starts a letter with the, it is with uh, great sadness and heavy heart that we inform our brothers and sisters in Christ and a Syrian community of the untimely passing of his holiness, Mar Adi II, Catholicus, Patriarch, and Supreme Head of the ancient Church of the East, who passed on the internal eternal life at 10 45 a.m on friday uh the 11th and his holiness goes in and i'm gonna only read a part of it and then you can pick it up rabbi his holiness mar ade was born in january 6 1948 in mosul iraq he was ordained into the deaconate and elevated to the priesthood on september 15 1968 in baghdad iraq he was consecrated a a metropolitan of the church of the east for iraq on september 26 1960 
2008 at Marzea Cathedral in Baghdad, Iraq. Following the untimely passing of the late His Holiness Marto Madermo, he was elected as Catholic as Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East uh, on February 20th, 1972. And uh, I'm not sure how old he was. I know he was either in his late 20s or um, late teens or early 20s, but uh, you know, take it away, Rabi. Yeah. Let's, uh, who, yeah, who, who uh, was yeah. Mar Adi? Well, Marad Day basically, uh, as you explained and was, uh, you just read, uh, Marad Day is the patriarch of the ancient church of the East. Uh, Marad Day was born in 1948, in January of 1948, in a village called Hashatiane, which is in Semel, uh, modern day in, mm. in, in part of Dehok or Nohadra. Uh, he, his parents Can you say were, that again? Can you say the name again? Hashatiane. Hashitiane. Hmm. the village of Hashitiane. That's what that, hmm. that was the biography that was. Uh, and uh, his parents were uh, his father, the late Georgis Mikhail Hormis, uh, and then his mother was Elishwa uh, Goriel uh, Shumwan. That was, these were her, uh, his parents, basically. Uh, from his childhood, uh, I mean, the, these things come with you. They just don't come. The love of church doesn't just come instantly. <laughs> it, it has to start at home. It has to start at home. Mm -hmm. Parents are uh, responsible. So his parents from his childhood, they encouraged him quite a bit to participate uh, church prayers and continue to grow spiritually. I mean, that's that's who he was. The parents played a big role in preparing him for that position, even though they didn't know what they were uh, preparing him for. But uh, I always say home is school. Uh, first, your mm -hmm. first school is home, basically. This is it. Uh, he was ordained as a deacon uh, and a priest, the uh, uh, name Shlemun Giorgis, uh, back in September 1968, September 15, 1968, at the city of Baghdad in uh, St. Zaya Cathedral, basically. Uh, the person who ordained him, basically, was His Grace Mark Polis Konikar, Polis uh, Konikar Polis, the Bishop of India. That's who he was. That's the person who ordained him, basically, as a deacon and a priest. Uh, we're just going through these uh, uh, details a little bit. as We'll try to kind of shed some light on some of these points as we stop. Uh, on September 21st, 1968, he was ordained as an archdeacon uh, under the name Reverend Schlemann Georgis. Mm -hmm. So not long after his, uh, his uh, being a deacon, uh, and a priest, uh, and these are the ranks of the church that you got to go one by one until you get to higher ranks, of course. Mm. Uh, and when we interview you, Rabi, the next time um, when we sit down with you and have a sit down with you on your on your life, I want you to explain, and not many people know their ranks, and, and, and a lot of people say, well, is a patriarch, what is a patriarch? And I always have to say, the patriarch is the equivalent of a pope for the Catholic Church. But yeah. our ranks, actually, there are nine. And we're not going to talk about them today, but he no, had no. all nine. So there no. are three, 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 which is three deacon no. and three priests. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get a one on one with you. But he, you know, this is why you're explaining the different aspects of the uh, positions and the elevations. Definitely. Definitely. So continuing on that, basically on the same day in September 21st, 1968, uh, Reverend George Moken, uh, who now is uh, Mar Apram Moken, the Metropolitan of India, uh, serving for the Assyrian Church of the East, uh, was on the same day that he was ordained Archbishop, uh, uh, Archdeacon, basically, uh, Reverend Moken was ordained as a bishop. So they had quite a bit of relationship together. And on September 26, 1968, Shlema Giorgis, known as Reverend, basically, was consecrated as a bishop and then archbishop, basically, under the name Mar Adde mm. in the city of Baghdad in Marzia Cathedral uh, as the Metropolitan of Iraq. And that was basically, like I said, that 1968 on September 22nd. Uh, on October 11, 1968, Mar Adde, the Metropolitan of Iraq, along with Mar Apramokan, and many priests, deacons, and large crowd consecrated Martoma Dermo uh, to be the patriarch of the ancient Church of the East. So he had, he comes a long way, like I said, 50 years of service, uh, 
quite a good, quite a bit of involvement uh, basically in the church and how it was uh, basically prepared and where he come about. Uh, His Holiness Mark Toma Dermo, basically Catholicus Patrick of the Eastern Church of the uh, East fell asleep in hope of resurrection back on the September 7, 1969, I believe, 1969, yes. And the church basically back then remained without a patriarch uh, until 1972. Then Mara was then elected to be the successor of Mark Tomodermo basically for the patriarch as the patriarch of the ancient church of the East. That's in, back in 1972, uh, that's where he was ordained. Uh, mm-hmm. So he was consecrated mm-hmm. on February 20th, 1972, uh, through the imposition of hands by his beatitude, Mar Narse Toma, Metropolitan of Kirkuk, and his beatitude, Mar Toma Eremia, a Metropolitan of Nineveh, along with many clergy and faithful of the church. So. Mm-hmm that's when he took uh charge or that's where he became the patriarch of the ancient church of these february 20th 1972 and as as we know he fell asleep nine days before reaching the 50-year mark wow and that's how, uh, how long yes. was it uh nine nine days i believe nine or 11 wow. days or so something like that before before and i know 50th. I know that we, that we were we were preparing a big celebration we for his 50th here at the church, and I know everybody was going to be coming, and that's yes. yeah, sad that he didn't reach it. Definitely, definitely, and uh, the uh, he served, like I said, as 50 years uh, is becoming the among the longest serving patriarch in modern day history. Actually, that's yeah. a long time, 50 years, if you look into history. Yeah. So during and, his term, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, at a young age like that, can you just imagine, Robbie, taking on the role of a church head, not only church leadership, but having the whole church, well, uh, for those of them, of course, that were members of the church, looking to him for answers, doing one of the most chaotic times in Iraq. I mean, people need to understand. I mean, yes, we have the president of the United States and we have, you know, every one of us goes to a church, uh, but imagine a whole nation depending on every word that comes out of your mouth. Uh, the Assyrian nation waiting on uh, what he will say, what, and, and this is the, the beauty of the love that he had. This is what impressed me the most. Um, he loved his nation so much. He loved his faith so much. The, the books that we have, the liturgy uh, books that we had, he know he knew it from his heart. So talk about his sacrifice at a young age of, I believe he was 23, 24 years old when he took on this role. 24 years old. And that's very young, basically, to take on such responsibility. Uh, when you become uh, involved in church, especially I myself, and I'll tell it to everyone else, it is really, uh, it's, it is very hard. Uh, and it's a big responsibility uh, because everyone is looking up to you to do the right thing. Everything you say, you speak, you do, you're under a microscope and yeah. you have to be at your best at every time and basically you need to earn the trust of people and people have to trust you for what you do. So it is a, it is a responsibility and at 24, 26 years old to take on a, such a big role, that is that is hard, that is hard, especially during the times that they were going through and the difficulties that the church was going through. So it's been, it's been a struggle for him pretty much all his life, the way I know it, the way I, uh, I understood it anyway. And so he really suffered quite a bit during the 50 years. There wasn't much of time that he kind of, uh, you know, uh, had fun in it in, in any way, but it's a, such a burden, such a major responsibility to carry it all the way through 50 years. And I believe uh, God was in the picture there at every time and to maintain that, uh, that level, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the day, basically. So God with him, definitely has been with him throughout this his journey. Uh, Absolutely. Until he fell yeah. Go so, ahead and continue, uh, Rabbi, with the biography. So, yeah, during during his term, basically, you see, uh, he has accomplished quite a bit, basically, under under uh, under his administration. Uh, during his term, many churches and communities were established throughout the world. Uh, 
you know, many people don't know that. I mean, it goes yeah. into the Middle East, from Middle East to Australia, to New Zealand, United States, Canada, uh, most of, I mean, Europe itself. So mm -hmm. a lot of things basically uh, that he was able to uh, communicate and make things happen. Uh, uh, so I just, I'm just going to go through some of these things that he has done, basically things that were accomplished under his administration, mm -hmm. his, uh, his term. Uh, the establishment of the Patriarch's Palace, basically, that's in Baghdad, which is a great building. Uh, I went there in September, last uh, this September, basically, in last year. I was there. Uh, it's a great place to be, honestly. And also another building that's an extension to it, right next to it, uh, to, to the Patriarch Palace, basically. And he established the St. Mary Church, which is part of that uh, Patriarch Palace, a beautiful church, great, great church, basically. Uh, St. Shmoni Church uh, in Dora, which is a city where mostly, I mean, most of the Assyrians are well, well familiar with the city of Dora, I say. That's, that's, uh, and uh, St. Saint George, St. Saint Georgius Village in Sharafia, that's a great church as well. Uh, uh, St. Shmoni in, in the village of uh, Bakluja, uh, Nohadra in modern day uh, Dohok. In 1994, I remember actually meeting him here in Los Angeles in 1984 when he came uh, when he came to Los Angeles basically and he did a trip to the United States and and he was able to after leaving there basically going back to Australia he was able to establish uh, help establish San Odisha Church which is mm -hmm. in Chicago it's, it's, uh, it's one of the main uh, places that our community we have a major a big community in Chicago San Zaya Cathedral in Sydney Australia is one of the largest churches at wall too uh, St. George in Melbourne, Australia, St. George in, uh, in St. Shmoni in Canada, basically, in Modesto, uh, St. Mary in Los Angeles, St. Shalita Church, Marshalita Church, which I am the priest for, Phoenix, Arizona, as we know, St. George, Sweden, St. George. I mean, all of these churches and communities were established during his time. And, and St. George is, in, in Glendale. In Glendale, Arizona, yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> And uh, most of that, basically, and along with that, it's not just a church. You have halls. You have many things that we, that he was basically, he was able to help and uh, lead uh, to get these things taken care of. And so he came. Basically, he did. He did quite a bit of work to bring the church to where it is today, uh, which is uh, spread out throughout the world. And, uh, and we kind of appreciate, honestly, all his hard work, what he has done to the church and. Uh, you know, uh, his time, uh, God called him home. Uh, but we have to carry the uh, the uh, torch from here and move on and, you know, do the best that we can for the church. And also during yeah. his time, many prelates were ordained uh, from deacons mm -hmm. to priests to bishops, archbishops. I mean, he did all that stuff. So these are these are his uh, his accomplishments uh, uh, that he did as a patriarch of the church. And most of these, like I say, they fall into his laps. I mean, is that's a responsibility? Uh, everyone is looking up, <laughs> look at looking at you, looking up to you to for guidance. Yeah. And so he did his yeah. part. He did, despite what he was going through in Iraq and the tough times, uh, and also basically under his administration, there was a magazine used to be issued in uh, out of the Patriarch's Palace there called Upka or the Horizon. Uh, it's a beautiful magazine. It's cultural, spiritual, educational magazine. It used to be, I mean, great, great articles. I've seen it and I've read some of the articles. So great, great uh, magazine, definitely. Uh, so yeah. this takes a lot of work uh, for people to administrate and look at and make sure things are moving in the right direction. So that's some of the things that uh, what he did. But despite all what the country of Iraq went through, we know what they went through. Uh, he devoted all of his life uh, and decided to stay like you when you opened your monologue, basically, to stay in Iraq. And the reason was, basically, he wanted to be with his people. Mm -hmm. That's where he wanted to be. I mean, he and was... And there you was, are, Rabi. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but we're getting to the pictures where uh, you are at... Yes. Uh, you are kissing his right yeah. hand, and there yeah, you are. I think that's Marshalita yeah, that's, Church. This is Marshal Lita, that's Ben and myself and His Holiness uh, Patriarch, basically. And the thing with the, with the, with His Holiness, he knew people. And every time he called, he mentioned people by name. He asked about people. So he was a people's person. 
Yeah. Like I said, he was a very humble person, honestly, very down down to earth person. Uh, so as you intimidating can see, so at times uh, from personal experience, intimidating at times. But there was also if you can just leave that picture up, Fred, what I want to um, the one that right before it, when uh, Ravi are standing, there's a smirk about him that uh, mm -hmm. there was a smirk about him that, you know, at first you walk in, you know, you kiss, you kiss his ring and you're feeling, you know, the, 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 the power, the authority. And then he smirked and then it just, it made everything well. You're like, yeah, I'm okay with it. So there's that smirk that I love that. Uh, he was a beautiful yeah. man. He was such a beautiful man, truly. Yeah, I I, I never felt uh, much of being a strange uh, position with him. Honestly, I felt so close to him. Like I said, he was like a father figure. You talk to him yeah. freely, discuss things openly with him, and he was just straight uh, talker. Basically, there was no politics involved in it. Uh, so he was he was truly truly humble person. Uh, he, yeah. Like a, yeah, his dedication and his life and staying in Iraq, basically, he was an icon. Uh, he yeah. gave hope to many people uh, to stay to stay in Iraq, actually, and keep the faith in the homeland, despite the atrocities, the uh, the uh, opposition, the oppression the church went through, faced through. I mean, uh, since especially since the fall of the last regime in Iraq in two thousand three. I mean, the church went through tough times. It yeah. was hard, but he decided to stay because this is where even even Simona, when he used to come here to the United States, after two, three weeks, let's say, he would be calling to go back home. I'm done. Yes. I need to go back to my people. I need to go back to my people. Yeah. And that was his main thing. Uh, it's going back home. This is where yeah. he used to to be with his people and people loved him adored him they they knew him i mean he was a he was a great figure in in, in iraq actually and most of the uh, head of the government knew him pretty well and uh he yeah. played an active role actually an active role in being a uniter uh, of the christian communities in iraq as you know uh mm -hmm. as he participated and hosted many many meetings to advance the unity among the christian community in iraq he was quite a bit involved in that actually yeah uh, and so. all of that and all of that rabbi doing it in silence as a humble servant of the lord absolutely um in obscurity and no one seems to know about it now we're talking about it as if and this is why it was so important that um that we feature these pictures and a lot of people would have said this man did this but I wish there were videos and there are many videos currently that were taken, but videos of the days in the past where people were, in fact, living in chaos. I mean, not enough can be said today. We're not going to do this, the life of this man, justice, his holiness. I mean, what can be said about a man that not only served for as many years as he did, but it, he did it under a life uh, threatening all the time it was the circumstances of threats he lived under the Ba'ath regime the iraq iran war both yes. gulf wars and of course the chaotic disaster the, of the toppling of saddam hussein that left the christians and mostly of course we're you know we're talking about the syrian church but everybody uh, uh not to not to kind of say this group more than that but the christians suffered the most because um it ushered in the age of terrorism of Al Qaeda, when if you can recall, and I'm sure you uh, know more, you know, and and can uh, probably explain a lot more. When people, when 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 the terrorists came and knocked on on people's doors and said, you know, they gave them so-called choices: convert, yes. uh, you know, pay the jizya, or either be killed or you know somehow leave. Or uh, Mar uh, Mar a day is only as Mar a day witnessed all of that because. There was a bomb, um, uh, bombing, two cars were bombed in front sure. of the church that he served. And I'm sure we're going to be showing those churches. And he loved that church so much. And I heard him say, I want to go home. I heard him yes. so many times say, I want to go home to my to my church. And we'll be showing pictures of that glorious church. Um, and so do you know details? And I know that his niece was hurt. His nephew, yeah, his, his own family was 
his niece was injured her eye i believe she lost an eye when one of those yeah. and one of the other things basically his holiness uh, many people don't know but he was approached by thieves actually he had the cross on his chest was ripped from him basically and so mm -hmm. they then you know, there's uh, and hope and gaining some gold or something so he has been attacked he's been like i said it's, it was not an easy journey for him for all the 50 years yeah. that he lived but despite all that he loved his country he loved his people he wanted to be there he stayed there he knew his position he knew why he wanted to go back always because yeah. people he gave people hope when he's there that's what it was and, there, and there's pictures of the church that we're showing there was yes. the cross at the very time being lit and uh i kind of played with the, one of the pictures i don't know how i found this picture it was on the internet but the last picture uh leaving um and i don't know i seem to think maybe he knew that he would perhaps never be back to it even though he longed to be there he is with the people and it makes me emotional really to think about it yeah 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 so basically his journey coming to an end uh, uh on february 11 22 uh like i said it was about 10 45 a.m uh, just a few minutes after that, I got a phone call and uh, like as it was nine days, nine days to the mark before reaching his exactly 50 years, which is a golden anniversary for his service. Mm -hmm. uh, short of celebrating that 50 years, uh, he passed away in a city of Phoenix in Arizona, as you know, and so far away from his homeland that he loved. Mm -hmm. I mean, he spent all of his life uh, being wanting to be there and it is it is sad the way i see it to leave his homeland basically and come into the end at a place where he's thousands of miles away if we can uh pause on that picture if you're uh go back uh one picture fred if you don't mind um where they are draping his attire on that chair uh of course he's not there but uh it is truly sad to see yes. that because if he was yep. there, he would be wearing it and, of course, uh, yep. celebrating liturgy. It's so sad. Yep. That is That picture, it, uh, it tells you a lot of stories there, basically. That, that chair is empty. That person who loved to be there is no longer there. Uh, but his, his legacy will move on, will stay, will continue on. And uh, for all the work he has done for the church, and we truly, truly, truly appreciate it. Uh, we're, we're saddened to lose him. Uh, uh, we pray that God will uh, come to our rescue and uh, make things better. And uh, I'm sure He has something for us. And we'll let we'll let God do the work, basically, and we'll do our job. Amen. Uh, I mean, you were saying that terrorists or thieves uh, uh, stole His Holiness's yes. cross. Well, yes. the cross was as in His heart. When Christ is in our heart, no one can steal Christ from us. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. I'm sure if he had asked, if the thief had asked for it, I think his holiness would have given it to him. So um, I am sure. it's I truly mean, sad. Yeah. 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 It, it and is so, sad, um, yeah, because he's, he was faithful, you know, and, and that comes um, to mind a question that I want to ask you and maybe we'll, in the future, when we have a sit down, we'll talk about it on the program, Rabi, we always talk about and the reason mm -hmm. why we launched this program from the beginning was because of the persecution that that we've suffered. And we've witnessed, you know, very little is being talked about and very little is being seen. I guess we're not sensational enough. We're not a, a, a nation that is, uh, you know, significant enough in the world. And, and I'm sorry to have to say this. I love my Christian uh, all members of the Christian body, but it's unfortunate that this genocide that we have gone through, it's almost like we don't fit in the Christendom or maybe the body of Christ's calendar of events that they would pause to see a great man like who we are talking about today. Had we, you and I not brought this program together, had we not been talking about, would anyone have known who His Holiness Mar'adde is and what a pivotal, pivotal, uh, position he has taken that decided if the Assyrians would survive for the most part because of the leadership that he and, and his flock would survive or not. Because he basically is, you can say, staying in Iraq made it possible that all of them 
can actually uh, survive by his leadership and his guidance. Absolutely, absolutely. Who, yeah, talking about it? Who, would be, who would be talking about it today if we didn't? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, this is this is our job, basically, to bring uh, uh, these actions and these good work basically to light. So maybe people may know. Uh, and like I said, uh, there isn't enough time to sit here and talk about his accomplishments and the kind of person yeah. he was. And I loved what I loved about him. Again, I this is something that I look at when a person is so humble and so down to earth and that is to me worth a lot to me. You know, I can I can communicate with him. I can see him. I can sit on. I mean, within within <laughs> close by and discuss things without being afraid or being kind of hesitant to say things. Yeah. Uh, this is this is what makes church uh, worth working for and hard, working hard as much as you can, basically. And that's how we gain people's trust base. That's that's to me, that's how I look. Yeah. At it, so. And see that 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 actually is a segue for me to ask, because uh, on this program, we're always telling people and I don't know if people believe me or not, because as we get involved and we are active in our community, we always say the Assyrians live in the Assyrian church or the church generally. Our faith is our life and the church has become a since the conversion of Christianity, actually, the Mother Church has been forced into a role of unifying us. It's been a church state to protect its people from extinction. The church mother has been and still remains uh, a refuge, uniting, sheltering, sustaining her scattered, beaten and abused children. The church mother remains a primary beacon of hope, a safe haven during some of the most brutal persecutions and the untimely, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the saving grace really leading to the survival of, of us. I mean, I was raised in the church and you, I mean, from your background, you are all church. If anything, I mean, <laughs> you preserved, you know, your family preserved the faith of the church. So we are yes. grateful to the Holy Church and truly thankful for the leaders that have dedicated and in many cases in history, sacrificed their lives for the survival of a nation without the church um you know where would we be Rabbi? and it's unfortunate oh. today that here we're not you know we're losing stories like mara Ad days and and not saying it enough to say the church gave us life christ of yes. course gave us life yes. and salvation but if it wasn't for the church how would we have known christ wouldn't we have denied him in the face of all the atrocities isn't that a miracle that we're still alive because of the church? As as Assyrians, basically, uh, regardless uh, who you are, I take pride of my church. It's my church. Uh, church, like you said, is a mother. Yeah. Uh, I always say there are five mothers in life. One of them is a church. When gives you when the church gives you that baptism, mm -hmm. it calls you to christ and the church of the east has played a big role a big major role actually in keeping our identity keeping our language uh i mean i am i am a living testimony to that honestly uh i can tell you quite a bit uh, may people may disagree but i say you know <laughs> without the church uh, we've taught language we kept language alive we kept traditions alive and this is what the church does, uh, and that's what we supposed to do. Uh, and like I said, for every Assyrian, I say, be proud, be proud of your church, be proud of your church, uh, because Absolutely. it's a mother. That's a mother yeah. to me, and I am, I am, I am really humbled by and having such a. Uh, you more, you go dig deep in the history of the church, and my God, I mean, many people are not reading about it; they just heard. But you dig deep in there, and you say, you will even love it much more. Trust me, you will. So. It makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. And so if we would, um, Rabi, if you don't mind, I don't know if you have the schedule of uh, what will be happening. I know that uh, the services will be starting on Thursday. And so I was wondering if you uh, yeah. could tell us what would be ha what will be happening. So uh, as far as I know, Thursday uh, in the afternoon, we will since since this service is for uh, for such a 
high rank of the church takes uh, it's, it's a really a lengthy a lengthy service so we're going to break it into yeah. two days service uh, so in the evening basically we'll we'll have uh, half the service let's say uh by three o'clock i believe that was the schedule uh for three hours of prayers and uh, paying respect uh, and honor to his holiness uh, and then there's going to be a viewing uh, for public viewing, basically for people to come and uh, just, uh, you know, for the last <laughs> sing farewell. Uh, and then on Friday uh, at 9 a.m., uh, we'll start the mass and that'll be uh, basically the last portion of, of uh, before we head out to cemeteries. And uh, and then on, on uh, Saturday, there'll be always a second day of the service as well in the evening, uh, evening prayer. And then on Sunday, uh, they'll be on the third day service as well. And we go back to the cemetery. So it is, uh, we have a long uh, program coming up. Uh, and I myself going to be in Phoenix on Wednesday in preparation yeah. and yeah, getting things set up. Basically, we have to be there. So, yes, we yeah. have quite a bit ahead of us. And, and it's well worth yeah. it. Uh, I think, you know, it's well worth it too. Absolutely. It's a yeah. four day celebration of his life. Of course, we never say, uh, we don't talk about death and talk about that, uh, yeah. Ravi, if you don't mind. Um, we talk about a celebration uh, of life. And of course, we talk about falling asleep because the Bible does say you will not die. Yes. You will fall asleep. And of course, Absolutely. we are falling asleep. And then we'll talk about Absolutely. a little bit about that. Absolutely. And that's that's what St. Paul, I mean, the Holy Scripture teaches basically with the Christian faith is that there is no death. There's no death. It's mm -hmm. a temporal, what we call this, falling asleep and then waking up when uh, you are with Christ, uh, pretty much. Yes. Uh, and that's what we believe in. Uh, that's what we believe in. It's a, it's a hope of yeah. resurrection, as Christ put it. I mean, Christ demonstrated that to us and see us as a Christian. We should take that to the heart. Uh, yeah. So we don't, we don't mourn. Uh, yes, we are saddened, but we yeah. don't mourn like those, uh, basically, who do not have that faith. But we, yeah, we will miss, we will uh, feel sorry, we will be sad. But, uh, you know, with, with God's help, basically, and through faith, we'll carry through this. And, uh, you know, and, and I hope the community understands that, basically, as well. So we'll yeah. come together and uh, pay the respect the way it's supposed to be for His Holiness. Uh, I mean, I always love the word holiness. Many people... Uh, I like to kind of shed some light on holiness. Uh, I know, and in fact, I know there's only one holy, it's Christ himself. I mean, holiness mm -hmm. comes in. But holiness is holiness is when you take, when you dedicate your life, is when you take something and dedicate it for a certain function, and especially in spirituality like this. When you take your whole life and dedicate it for the church, that deserves the label holiness. Mm -hmm. Because you saved all your life in serving that function or that position or that whatever it is, basically. <laughs> so it is a great honor. It is a great honor to be, uh, you know, in that rank and uh, and to be called uh, by that. You name. know, and the and the Bible does and the Bible does say we are called to be saints. We are saints, but at the same time, yes. not in the in the in the. Uh, in the way where we're going to boast about, yes, I am a saint. But at the same time, uh, when you have a no. man who's dedicated no. <laughs> his life as his holiness, you know, it's it's an honor to call him holiness because of the fact that he yes. has um, voluntarily, voluntarily, um, you know, he, he, he could have been chosen and he could have said no, but he voluntarily took on this this great burden to carry that cross and to say, yes, Lord, I will, I will come. That's it. You know, I will carry that cross willingly, that's willingly and lovingly and joyfully, you know? So that's a lot to yes. be said for someone living that knows he would find nothing but hardship, knowing that you will find nothing but uh, disputes and confrontations and people trying to break you down. And despite that, here we are speaking about, his commitment, his love, um, and uh, his service. Very true. Yeah, very true. Yep. Uh, now, loss, uh, from but, this point uh, on, I know I a lot it's, of the bishops. Uh, yeah. 
Now, I know all the bishops are here. Sorry? I know uh, from Australia, from Canada, yes. uh, from Iraq, they're all coming. Yeah. They're all here, if not getting here. Yeah. So that was good. I mean, I know we have this uh, this atmosphere of COVID. And of course, we need to be all um, you know, aware and we need to be attentive to the guidelines. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that they were able to be here because I think we're all looking right now for our spiritual fathers to kind of... Uh, you know, um, not guide us, but comfort each other so we can find comfort in them. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, God has something to do with it, basically made it possible for some of these uh, spirit uh, church leaders to from across the oceans to be able to come in at such times, basically. So and it's really not easy to grant guarantee visa and moving back and forth these days with the conditions and what we're going through. Yeah. But uh, God is always good, basically. And like I said, uh, all the church fathers are here, uh, whether it's uh, Marzay, I know he's there. Mark Thomas is there. Uh, Marsha Munez should have been arriving, should have been arrived, should have arrived yesterday, I believe. Uh, Mariapa is there, Mark yeah. Greg is there, so and Mark is going to be there. So these are the church leaders right now, and they're all going to be uh, present at the, during the uh, services. And uh, uh, so people will see them okay. and take heart, and this, basically. Yeah. And this is known as the Holy Synod, which is the members of the bishops and, and metropolitans. And after the uh, services are done, um, I guess there are going to be, I mean, that's going to be probably announced at a future date. But this is the same synod that would normally meet and, of course, uh, elect a new leader, correct? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, it is the same same people. This is the same group that gets, sits together in the synod minus the uh, his holiness definitely so so it's, it's the senate of bishops yeah. uh, basically so that's, that's what's called yeah. since the patriarch is not there so that's what's going to be called yeah. until until god knows whatever happens and i will we'll let them we'll let them uh, basically sit and decide and talk among each other and see what's good for the church and uh let god be the guidance pray for all of them it. and you know yeah good news for the church i pray i pray Always pray for goodness. Amen. Amen. Well, Rabbi, it was yeah. wonderful to have you on the program today. Um, it was so refreshing, and thank you. And just having you on the program, I was thinking when I was doing when I was going to do this program, I really didn't want to do it uh, by myself because I, I I thought I was going to cry. But you truly gave me the courage today, and your presence made it possible that we're comforted. And your words are truly. Um, um the medicine that we needed for our hearts to heal and so we want we appreciate you we love you uh we thank honor you. you as well for all of all of you do for the community and like i said thank we're going to have a sit down with you in the future but your last words today for those that are mourning for those that are saddened and for those that are uh, wondering what will come next well my last word is basically uh, our faith, our hope, uh, our strength. Everything comes from Christ. Mm -hmm. Everything comes from Christ. We are only servants. Uh, we are not owners of the church. We are not lords of the church. Uh, there, there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ himself. So we'll leave everything in his hands. We'll submit our hearts, our thoughts, our minds into his hands. And we ask him through Christ our Lord basically to be to lead us into good future, uh, peace, uh, loving future for the church, for the church of East in general, I say, for the church of East in general, uh, because it's all Amen. one church. It is, to me, it's all one church. And with that, I'll probably conclude my uh, my comments with the prayer, uh, as we started with the prayer, and I'll conclude it with yes. the prayer of you don't mind. Yeah, Amen. so, Heavenly Father, Eternal rest grant His Holiness, O Lord. Perpetual light shine upon Him. May He rest in peace, love always, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen, Rabbi. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm sure we'll have you back. Uh, viewers, thank you so much for being on the program. 
uh, being with us throughout the program and don't continue to share this program, please, because it has so much information. And this man, this man that you see on your screen deserves the attention of the world, deserves that not that he ever wanted it on earth on earth he has already received his reward in in heaven but on earth he needs to be he need we need to see him and look at him as an example of service of love of commitment and uh and the willingness to do it voluntarily and to do it happily because a lot of times as christians we may be doing it, but we do it not because we want to do it. We we do it because we're forced to do it, or we're, we're negle- you know we're we're not very happy to do it. This man loved his job. If there was anyone that I know that truly loved his job, was this man. He loved interacting with his people. He loved interacting with the church. He loved hearing people's problems and being able to say, "Let's solve it together." He was, as Rabbi Kasha said. Uh, Kor Bishop uh, Atanas has just said he was a people's person. Uh, many people that know the Assyrian Church of the East, the leadership sometimes can become a little, uh, uh, not scary, but they can become a little kind of out of reach because of the uh, taboos that are involved. And there are many nowadays that are being ordained that we are seeing are more approachable. They're more friendly. We're able to discuss and speak on many different subjects that were unseen or unheard of that uh, could be discussed uh, in the, at any time. So I want to thank you for being uh, with us on this program. And please share this program and let people know this is what servitude is. This is what carrying across this. This is what, and, and I can almost guarantee you, I know that he wanted to be with his family on earth, as Paul says, absent with the body is present with the Lord, but he wanted to stay a little longer with us so that he would be that father figure, continue to be that father figure. But I truly believe that he is in heaven, that he's happy and he will be praying for us, but continue to spread the word of godliness and of the fact that he had so much love for his country that he was willing to give up his life. And he basically did because his illnesses all came from one fact is that he was there and he took it on and he took on the enemy of all mankind head on. Uh, And he was always on the front lines. So thank you once again, we love you. And we're gonna try to see uh, if we can bring you a live feed of the funeral uh, services uh, from the Mona Kay show. Uh, So please keep tuning in and like our page and let your friends know to like our page so that we can continue to bring you broadcasts like this. We will see you next Tuesday otherwise, but God bless you. We love you. Shlama. Shlama
Thank you.